We're finally doing it. This is actually happening. Thank you for your patience, everyone. My name is Jeff Woods. I work here with The One Thing with Gary Keller and Jay Papazan. Today is the one thing for developing a millionaire mindset. And I'm going to give you a quick overview on our guest, John Asaraf. He's someone that I've been personally following for the last eight years. And it started when I took one of his best-selling books called The Answer on a trip with me to Europe. Uh, at the time, frankly, I was lost. I was in need of direction and really upgrading my mindset. And somebody had recommended his book to me. I literally carried that one book with me across Europe, and, and I loved every minute of it. Then I saw him in the hit movie, you may have heard of it, called The Secret. I saw him on Larry King Live. He just seemed to be everywhere. And last year, I actually had a chance to meet with him face-to-face -face in his offices in San Diego when I did an interview on him for entrepreneur.com. So this is a guy who's really made an impact in my life and someone that I strongly encourage, Jay, that we bring on the webinar, which is why he's here today. Outside of John just being one heck of a good guy, He's really a great businessman as well. He's built five multi-million dollar companies, including growing Remax of Indiana from 15 to 1,600 salespeople and over $4.5 billion a year in sales. Then he went on to found Bamboo.com, where he went from nothing to $10 million a month and eventually had a successful IPO on Wall Street. Today, he is the CEO of Neurogen, which developed some of the most advanced neuroscience-based training programs in the world. And the whole goal is helping people just like you maximize your full human potential. So the reason we're introducing you to John today is because when you look at what helped him achieve such an extraordinary level of success in so many different business ventures, much of it's aligned with the message of the one thing. So we wanted to give you a real life case study of what happens when you live some of these principles. So here is what we are going to cover today. Um, because I want to give you guys an idea of this, and then we're going to dive into the book for those of you who are new. The first is we're going to talk about some of the important lessons from John's career. He has a tremendous amount of experience to share with you. I know you'll get value. The second thing is we're going to dive into mindset and why it's so important. This guy's one of the leading authorities in the world when it comes to this, so this is a real treat. And then finally, we're going to talk about the newest evidence that's helping people release their underlying issues that's holding them back from achieving financial success. I know that there is a big group of you today who are with us for the first time who may or may not be familiar with the book. So we're going to take a few minutes to talk about the one thing, and then we're going to dive into John. At the heart of it is this focusing question, which is, what's the one thing I can do? Such that by doing it, everything else is easier or unnecessary. And this comes in many different forms or this really comes from the 80-20 principle, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. If you're familiar with the 80-20 principle, go ahead and put yes in the chat box. I want you guys to get engaged. You'll retain the information better. You'll have a heck of a lot more fun. So yes in the chat box. I love it. Okay, thank you. So this came, it's the whole idea that 80% of your results are going to come from 20% of your actions. And while most of us have heard of this, in my experience and from the people that I've spoken with, very few of us actually live it in our day-to-day -day lives. Out of curiosity, how many of you actually live 80-20 on a day-to-day? -day? You truly, every single day, focus on the 20%, those little hinges that are going to swing the big doors. Put yes or no in the chat box and be honest. Yeah, see, and I appreciate the honesty because it's a struggle. It's really hard. But when you do this, that's when you see the big results. That's when you get the big payoff. And so we're going to talk a lot about that because uh, the whole thing is that if you can focus on that one thing, that one thing that will get you the most results, if you can just focus on knocking that down, it spills over into all these other areas of your life. In the book, we call this a domino run. Okay? And I, I heard Jake say this so many times, but to date, the, the world record for this it's 4.5 million dominoes that got knocked down because they just knocked down the right domino first. Okay? So how does this apply to you in your life? When Gary and Jay wrote the book, they, they, they call this the seven circles, the seven areas of your life that really matter. You know, what's the one thing you can do for your spiritual life? 
such that by doing it, everything else is easier or unnecessary? What's the one thing you can do for your physical health, your personal life, your relationships, your job, your business, or your finances? It's about focusing in on one specific area and making it a habit. Okay, so that's, that's the big idea of the book. Now we're going to get into John Asaraf because he's going to discuss how you can develop a millionaire mindset and set yourself up to make 2016 your best year yet. So, John, can you hear me, brother? Hey there, my friend. Nice to uh, be on with you again. It's been a while. Yeah, I know. How's life? It's been great. So, why don't we just let's let's go back. Um, you've you've accomplished so much. You've had an incredible professional career, and you've made a massive impact, which is even bigger. Why don't we go back to Remax? When you started, what was the biggest challenge? Because I remember you telling me about how the business started to grow, but then you faced a plateau, and there was one thing that changed that all of a sudden you had explosive growth. Sure, we, we can talk about that, but if I can, can I just start off a little bit earlier than that? Because I've, I've got my people on the call right now. What I mean by that is when I was 19, I got into real estate and I had no idea about marketing, selling, managing my time. I had left high school when I was in grade 11. Uh, I was voted most likely to fail in life. I was a pretty good athlete and thought I would, you know, maybe play basketball, but um, that wasn't going to be. I wasn't that good. Um, but I want to share with people just one of the first lessons I got. The first three days I got my real estate license, which was June 20th, 1980, in Toronto, Canada. And the small little boutique real estate company that I worked for had uh, five offices and about 70, 80 agents between them. And the gentleman who was my, my first mentor asked me to, you know, what were my goals? He asked me to set my goals like he showed that wonderful graph you know, for spiritual health, wealth, relationships, career, business, etc. And I set my goals uh, based on what I thought I could achieve. And the first thing that uh, Alan Brown, my mentor, my first mentor, said to me, says, you're, you're setting your goals way too small. But I said to him, but, but I don't know how to sell real estate. I don't, I don't know how to make money. I don't know how to do anything in real estate. And one of the first things he said to me that I think will be worthwhile for everybody to write down is he said, first you set the goal and then you develop the skills to be able to achieve the goal. He said, never, ever, ever set a goal based on what you think you can achieve. Set a goal that scares you, that you don't know how to achieve, and then develop the right mindset, the right emotional management that you need to deal with the fears that come up when you don't know how to achieve a goal. He says, and then go and bust your ass to develop the skills that you can get off the shelf of what to do and become the type of person that it requires to achieve those goals. So I'll share with all of you, at 19, I made $35,000. I'm 55 now, so it's quite a while ago. But by doing what my first mentor suggested to me, I went on and made $151,000 my second year as a 20-year-old, selling $35,000 homes. So the first lesson is set the goal and then uncover the thinking, the emotions, and the behaviors to achieve that goal. And so from that, I think we can, we can start building from, from just that first lesson back in June of 1980 that I learned in the first three days of getting into real estate. And I started making a quarter of a million dollars a year working six, seven months a year and traveling the rest because I learned that very, very valuable lesson early on. So from there, um, I can share with you, I, I sold real estate uh, for about five years. Uh, actually, I sold real estate initially for two years. I traveled around the world for 14 months without working um, by taking the money I made from real estate, and I came back in 1986, I'm sorry, 1984, um, uh, uh, worked for a couple more years. Then I bought the franchising rights for Remax for the state of Indiana 
and started a career of, of franchising and building my, my company in Indiana and built that from uh, a startup to uh, just under 100 offices and 1,500 agents uh, in Indiana. So that's a little bit of my real estate background and then I sold that company in 2007 before the crash, thank God, and uh, started doing a few other things in the interim. So Josh, I just want to let everybody, um, Joff, sorry, I want to give everybody, um, Jeff, I want to give everybody a bit of a background <laughs> um, uh, uh, so they understand that I know what it's like to cold call, I know what it's like to knock on doors, I know what it's like to learn the objections and, and come up with the answers, I know what it's like to, to do every single thing that they are uh, needing to do right now. So here's my question for you. I'll sit in on some of Gary Keller's masterminds with some of the top agents, and it's always about growth. You've experienced what it's like to have a plateau, and I know that you were faced with a real challenge. You know, how do you break through that? How do you get your 1,500 people to start producing at such a higher level? Talk to me about the mindset shift and what they ended up doing to, to break through that. Sure. So back in 1992, we had hit a billion two in sales. And we were stuck. We hit a plateau. Yeah, it was a great plateau, but we weren't growing. And I was spending a crazy amount of money on, on books for my agents, on cassette tapes back then, on coaches, on speakers. And we were doing an enormous amount of motivating. And people were doing well for a day or a week or two weeks after all of these motivational events happened. But then they would plateau themselves and hit the levels of revenue that they were hitting before. And since I've been a student of neuroscience and neuropsychology for many, many years, I wanted to understand what is it within somebody's brain that causes them to plateau. And the answer really comes from understanding something called cybernetics. And many people on this call will remember the book Psycho-Cybernetics by Maxwell Maltz, who um, was a plastic surgeon that performed surgery uh, on people, whether it was their faces or other um, body parts. And in many cases, the people that had significant facial surgery never felt like they did anything, that, that, that Maxwell Maltz ever performed any surgery on them. They didn't see the changes that had occurred post-surgery. And that led him to really understand that it's the brain that has a pattern of recognition for somebody's face or body. It's the brain that has somebody's habits for what they do. It's the brain that has somebody's mindset that's fixed in a place called the implicit non-conscious brain. And that is the part of the brain that has been um, conditioned and, um, and grooved over time. And so what I realized is that my agents hit a plateau. And the only way to get them to break that plateau was to go back and help them retrain the non-conscious part of their brain. Not the part of their brain that has you know, beliefs that, yeah, I could do two or three times more in real estate sales, but it was actually the part of the brain that drove their perceptions, emotions, and behaviors day in and day out. It was by retraining the parts of their brain that had a fear of failure, a fear of rejection, of being a uh, fear of being disappointed again, a fear of their efforts not panning out, a fear of change. That's all part of the implicit, non-conscious part of the brain. So here's what we did. We uh, rounded up all of our agents. We had about a thousand people show up at a conference. And I said, hey, for anybody who really wants to change their incomes and is serious, I'm going to offer them an opportunity to learn with me for six months. And we're going to focus not on how to overcome objections, not on how to make you know, better cold calls, not on how to market better, not on how to get referrals, none of that stuff. We're going to focus for six months only on rewire, reprogramming their non-conscious brain, their beliefs, their perceptions, and their expectation point. And what we discovered through a lot of the research is every single person on this call, me included, you included, has a financial expectancy point. And what that means is yours and my brain 
has become used to achieving a certain level of income. And any level above or below that amount triggers something called the error detection mechanism in the brain. And then when that happens, your brain autocorrects your thoughts, your emotions, and your behaviors until you remain consistent what the expectations, uh, expectation point is at the non-conscious level of your psyche, your brain. And so what we did is we worked with 100 agents who paid $3,000 each, excuse me, 75 agents who paid $3,000 each to get trained on accessing the non-conscious part of their brain. Many of you may know it as the subconscious mind. It's now known by scientists as the non-conscious mind. And we started to focus on helping them do 15 to 30 minutes a day of inner sizes, basically exercises for your brain. And everybody's heard of visualization, everybody's heard of subliminal program, everybody's heard of guided hypnotherapy, and everybody's heard of you know affirmations. What we did is we actually created some audios for them. We created some methodologies to really access this parts of their brain without a lot of energy from them. So all they had to do was listen to these audios every day for six months, and they had to do some specific things outside of, of doing that. And what happened is within six months, we ended up selling $100 million more for that group of 75 agents. Now, you got to remember, this was going back to 1992. So 100 extra million dollars in sales ended up being at you know an average of let's say three or four percent commission to the company that sold it or the company that had the listing ended up being about a thirty five to forty thousand dollar increase average for seventy five people who were averaging at the time a million dollars in sales themselves so many of them doubled their income and I'm gonna say it again not by focusing on how to close more deals not by learning how to market better not by calling more people initially it was all around changing the non-conscious image they had of themselves, the non-conscious expectancy point they had for themselves. It was teaching them how to manage the emotion of being embarrassed or ashamed or ridiculed or fearing disappointment that they all were moving away from when real estate is a contact sport that requires you getting more engaged with people. So those are just some of the things that um, we had some fun with. And then we went on to build the company to about four and a half billion in sales. Um, but, but again, not by teaching people how to market better or sell more. It's by changing the inner mechanics of what was happening in their brains that govern their emotions and behavior. I, I'm, I want to open this up. And for the people who are listening to this, I want you to get engaged and think about some of the limiting beliefs that you have around scaling your business or around money. And put them in the chat box because I'd love to make this interactive. I'd love to throw some of them at John and have him walk through some of it. it this is about adding value to you. You're investing your time here right now. So go ahead and put those in the chat box. And if you have specific questions, we're looking for those as well. And we'll, we'll save those for Q&A toward the end. John, what do you find are some of the biggest limiting beliefs around people who want to make more money? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear the first part of your question. I heard make more money. What are some of the biggest limiting beliefs or most common limiting beliefs that people have around making more money or scaling your business? Sure. So obviously there are people that say, you know, I'm not smart enough. I'm not worthy enough. I'm not skilled enough. I'm too young. I'm too old. Uh, I'm new at this game. Anytime we have a, a belief, whether it's a deeply rooted belief or something that we call just a declarative belief, something that I declare, what that does more than anything else is that is the lens by which your brain sets up what you see. It's the lens by which it sets up what you feel, but more importantly, it's the lens by which your brain makes decisions for what you do or don't do. So if you have any type of a limiting belief, I'm not good enough, worthy enough, deserving enough, skilled enough, uh, old enough, young enough, Asian enough, Caucasian enough, African American enough, etc. If you have any type, of, <laughs> any type of limiting belief 
basically creates something called a stress response in the brain if you try to do anything that counters that belief. So let me let me give you an example. Let's say you have a belief that you know you, you, you're you're not skilled enough, and you try to take action when you consciously and even non-consciously feel you're not skilled enough. The first thing that happens, again, I love the mechanics of this because I had to understand why this was holding so many people back. The mechanics of when there is uncertainty, the sympathetic nervous system in the brain kicks in, and that is the flight, fight, or freeze response mechanism in the brain. And when that happens, the actual motivational center, there's actually a motivational circuit in the brain that gets shut down. That's like putting the brakes on the thinking or the behaviors that are required to achieve the success that you want. And most people are not aware that this is why they don't feel like doing what they need to do. This is why they get distracted and go do something more pleasurable. This is why they freeze and do nothing. And so I'm fascinated with the why. And so anytime you are putting a stressful request, and stress just meaning I am uncomfortable, I am not certain, I'm lacking confidence, anytime you push against that part of your brain, you will whether you like it or not, or understand it or not, put the brakes on your behavior. And the key is to first learn that this is a natural response that every human being and most animals have that has been evolving for billions of years. And here is what you must do. First, you must gain awareness that this is what is happening within you. And then you must learn a simple technique that I'll just give to everybody right now is whenever you're feeling stressed, whenever you're feeling that you're fighting with yourself or you're freezing, you know, um, what I want you to do is just stop and take six deep breaths in through your nose, out through your mouth. Now, I know this sounds simple and easy, but let me explain to you what happens. When you're in a stressful situation, a neurological stressful situation, and the biology follows that, and your physiology follows that, what we know is that the sympathetic nervous system is kicked in, and unless you are extremely skilled, like a firefighter, or like a police officer with tens of thousands of hours of training, you will either freeze, fight, or run away. But if you learn how to just take six deep breaths, you actually will shift. You hit the reset button in your brain to move to something known as the parasympathetic nervous system. And that means that you'll be able to activate your prefrontal cortex, specifically the left side of your prefrontal cortex that will show you the path to what you need to do to get over this fear response. And so when you know, you're a real estate agent and you're, you know things. Everybody that is listening to this call right now, every one of you knows of things you should be and could be doing to achieve more success, whether it's in your health, your wealth, your relationships, your career, your business, etc. But you're not doing them. And the question is why? And the answer is because there must be something going on neurologically that's putting on the brakes. And that is where your biggest breakthrough will come from is understanding that your brain will do more to avoid real or potential danger first before it will move you towards pleasure and achieving your goals. It is a natural biological response or neurological response that you just have to understand how the system works and you could become a master of overriding your, I don't want to, I can't, I don't know how to, it's not the right time, do I really want to achieve these goals, let me do it tomorrow, you know, Joe can do it because he's this, Mary can do it because she's that, but I can't because, 
and you'll fill in the blank and rationalize the reason why. So I'm watching the chat box and I'm seeing a lot of questions people have about changing certain beliefs. Some people it's about feeling worthy for success. Some people it's about the level of money that they can make. Where did these beliefs even come from and mm -hmm. how do we begin to recognize that? Like, I, I love what you just said about in that moment when you recognize your feelings, taking a few six deep breaths, which you should have seen Jay and I before the webinar, that we that would come in handy. We were like <laughs> hyperventilating over here. Um, how do we choose, how do we respond versus react? How do we how do we begin to shift that mindset? Right. The 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 natural instinct of every human being is to react without awareness or thought. And so first and foremost, you're all normal. The advanced version is to be able to recognize your thoughts, recognize your emotions, recognize the behaviors you're taking versus the behaviors you should be taking. But to come back to your question just a moment ago, we developed our beliefs initially through our parents and our caregivers through something known as the imprinting years. And when we are born, uh, we start to formulate our visual uh, parts of our neural pathways and the auditory and um, everything that's associated with them based on what we see, hear, smell, taste, and touch in our environment. Then we go to the next level of experiential learning where the environment that we're in and the experiences that we have reinforce what we have been told, what we have been asked of, what we have learned. And so your beliefs, your habits, your perceptions for the most part are due to your parents, caregivers, teachers, and experiences up until the time you were about 10 or 12 years old. And there's something in the neuroscience field called the brain plasticity switch. The brain plasticity switch is the switch that goes on when you're born that formulates all of these neural pathways or highways, just like you know, connecting a highway from you know, 10 cities you know, with all of the streets in between, all the major cities, your brain formulates these neural pathways of beliefs, perceptions, habits, that by the time you're 12 years old, the switch basically goes to being turned off. And so you've developed your beliefs and perceptions by the time you're 12, 13, 14 years old at the, at the most that will last you for your lifetime. Well, ask yourself a question. What was your experience like when you were you know, up until that age? Do you have great, wonderful uh, abundance memories? Do you have you know, the best beliefs possible, the best habits possible that you witnessed, experienced, and you know, um, uh, applied? Uh, for most people, they have some really good ones and some that suck. They have limiting beliefs that feel real to them and feel true to them because they've developed enough evidence at the non-conscious level to support the belief. The evidence will always support the belief. And then the habits are the building blocks of behavior. So if you take a belief that you actually want to achieve. If you ask yourself, how did my, let's say parents, how did my parents or parent instill any belief in me? Well, they, they told me what to believe based on what they believed. They shared stories with me. They uh, acted that way. They perceived the world that way. They took me to places that really were Exactly in line with those beliefs, we met people that had the same beliefs, therefore those beliefs must be true. And then whenever we saw somebody else, another environment that contradicted our belief, it was like that was something different for other people because we had our set of beliefs and all the references and experiences to match up with that belief. And so if you think about what is a belief specifically from a neuroscience perspective, it's nothing more than the pattern in the brain. That's all it is. It's like it's just a pattern in the brain. The pattern isn't right or wrong. It's either constructive or destructive. It's either moving you towards your goals and dreams or it's moving you away from it. And so all you have to do is ask yourself, is this belief that I have, 
about myself and about what's possible, is that going to get me to my goal? Yes or no? Not kind of, sort of, maybe. Yes or no? If it's not, what we know about beliefs is with the trillions of neural connections that we have in our brains firing in sequences that are automatic from the time we wake up to the time we go to sleep and then even while we're sleeping, we can interrupt any neural pattern and create a new neural pattern just the way it was created when we were babies. And when you take that new neural pattern, just a simple belief like I am worthy of achieving my goals, and we, let's say, say that is an affirmation and we feel it, and then we visualize it and we emotionalize it, and then we take two or three actions towards that being real, we start to create a new neural pattern in the brain. And here's something that I want every one of you to remember. It does not, I repeat, it does not take 21 days to develop a new habit. Whether it's a new habit of thought, a new emotional habit, or a new behavioral habit, it takes between 66 days and 365 days to create a pattern in your brain that's strong enough to become automatic so that you don't have to use any conscious energy or effort on it. 66 to 365 days. So if you are going to start, whether it's a weight release program, whether it is a prospecting, whether it's developing a new belief or a new habit, and you think you're going to do it in less than 66 days, don't even start. Don't waste your time. Well, I love that. I mean, I, I've got Jay sitting next to me, and he, you said 66 days, and here is his perspective. All the research that they did for the one thing, it, it, on average, it's 66 days to form a habit. And people always think it's 21 or 30, and they, they wonder why they're not getting the results. And that's just the average. It could be longer. Absolutely. Depending on how, if you think about what is a habit, a habit is whether it's a mental, emotional, or behavioral activity, and in most cases, they're all tied together, that requires zero motivation. It actually is what fuels motivation. And so it requires zero motivation. It requires almost zero energy for processing in the brain. And since your brain is an energy processing machine, 20, 25% of all of your calories are used by your brain. And the more energy something requires, the less your brain wants to do it. Why? Because it's an energy conservation tool, not an energy expenditure tool. It does not want to use up energy because it's focused on safety first and survival, the avoidance of pain second, and then and only then will it focus on the stuff that's motivating and pleasurable. One thing that, and this is because I've been a student of your work for eight years, and I've taken a lot of your programs, including winning the game of money and winning the game of business. You, people talk a lot about affirmations, yep. and I think they're grossly misunderstood because people think, I visualize myself having a million dollars. I visualize myself having a million dollars, and it's like Publishers Clearinghouse is not knocking on my door with a big fat check. <laughs> what are people missing when it comes to affirmations? Okay, so an affirmation is nothing more than a group of letters moved into words, moved into a sentence. It's just words. And so if I have an affirmation that says, you know, I am worthy of earning $100,000 a year. And that's a conscious language pattern that I've just chosen. That's great. Those are nice words. Now, beneath that conscious affirmation may be uh, an affirmation that you may not even be aware of. It says, bullshit, that's not true. So when you have a positive affirmation, but you have 20, 30, 40 years of a belief that's embedded into the non-conscious mind with all of the references of why that's not true, you're trying to pull a train with a string. Now, what, excuse me, when I take that affirmation and I realize that it's just an affirmation or it's just a declaration and I repeat that affirmation and I add a little bit of emotion and I know that the first thing that my brain is going to do 
is kick in the error detection mechanism and go, that's not true. You really believe this, this, or that. The first thing the untrained person does is they allow the thought or the unpleasant emotion to control the next thought. The trained person goes, the negative bubbling of that's not true or the negative emotion of that's not true that comes up next, the trained person goes, I know why I'm feeling that. That's because at the non-conscious level, I don't yet believe this. So how do I start to believe this more? And this goes into some of the training that we do, and that's around how do we get you to focus on that affirmation and the attitude around it and the expectation point around it, and that is called your mindset, is your ability to focus your mind on what you want versus what you don't want. That's number one. The next part is really to develop your skill set. And so if you know anything about the non-conscious mind, we also know that between the conscious and non-conscious mind, there's a gatekeeper. And the gatekeeper does not want to allow anything in the non-conscious mind because it just takes action on whatever is embedded in there. It doesn't have a filter. The filter exists between the conscious mind that can imagine and choose and the non-conscious mind that can only behave, whether it's automatic thoughts, emotions, or behaviors. So a smart person uses their higher level of mind or their spiritual genius part of them to understand that in order to access the non-conscious mind, there are a variety of different methodologies to use. So visualization is one methodology. And affirmation with emotion is another methodology. Guided hypnotherapy is another one. Self-hypnosis is another one. Subliminal programming is another one. There are about eight scientifically based methods to access the non-conscious mind. And when you do that over the course of a week, a month, two months, three months, four months, you basically start to develop a new pattern in the non-conscious mind that replaces in activity the old pattern that existed in that place. So you're basically doing a non-conscious renovation and you basically are out with the old, like a spring cleaning or a fall cleaning, out with the old, in with the new, but what happens is you are deliberate in what you are putting into the non-conscious mind. So now you're choosing using your deductive reasoning and your conscious abilities and you're accessing your own non-conscious mind to repattern the implicit, deeply rooted beliefs, perceptions, and habits that drive 98% of your current behavior. And when you do that, you're basically winning the inner game and transforming from the inside out as you start to take small action steps towards the behaviors that you need in order to achieve the goals that you want. I, I'll share a personal experience for the people because I'm seeing the questions that are coming in on this. There was a day where I received this information that it really is a choice. You can choose what information you allow to come into your mind. And when I surveyed most of the successful people that I was aware of, they made a choice. And they said no to a lot of things, like the news, the general media. Because if it, if it bleeds, it leads. And they started surrounding themselves with the right people, the right ideas. And they started investing in their mindset. And so that's just to kind of tie what John just said together because it was so much good stuff. This is a choice, people. And feed your, just like you feed your body, you need to feed your mind as well. Um, we're going to get into Q&A here with the time that we have left. Uh, I do, uh, several people asked if, they, if there was a course on this, John, or how can they start getting some of those inner sizes. Can you talk to them about the Brainathon that's going to happen on Saturday real quick? Absolutely. Um, what I've done is put together some of the top brain researchers and neuropsychology researchers in the world, and we do a brainathon. 
where we basically share information like what I've shared with all of you today. And we do it for free. And on the Brainathon, not only we bring people the latest information on what to do if you have a fear, fear of failure, fear of success, fear of not being good enough, fear of um, uh, disappointing yourself or other people. Once again, if you set goals, you don't achieve them or making commitments that you know you may fail at. What do you do if you've had a trauma? What if you do um, if your circumstances are not congenial? What do you do with all of the stuff that's holding you back? And so we do this Brainathon. And on the Brainathon, we also bring clients of ours that are using our brain retraining programs. And we have them share you know, where they were at, what they did, how it's transformed their life. And so you get a chance to see what we're doing and how we're doing it. And it's free, as I mentioned, and you can join us for half an hour or for seven hours if you want. Uh, if you sign up for it, not only will you be able to join us, but you'll also uh, be able to get the replay of it so you can watch it afterwards and have as part of your training. And if you decide that you want to see more of the programs we have, then we'll share that with you and you can make a decision to dive deeper if it's something that you, uh, if you like. But what I can share with you is we've had tens of thousands, I mean millions of people have gone through our, our trainings. Uh, tens of thousands of success stories of people working on the real science of motivation and inspiration and letting go of the stuff that's really in their way. And we've had people double, triple, quintuple their income. We've had people who were unhealthy that all of a sudden started to really get aligned with, with being healthy and relationships saved. And, and I mean, I can go on and on and on. So if you think that you want to learn more about the real evidence-based stuff that'll get rid of any of your mental or emotional blockages, uh, then join us for the Brainathon, and we will um, really help you get to that next level of success that I know you're capable of achieving. And I've personally gone through it before and loved it, which is, again, I'm a student of John's, which is why he's here in the first place. So strongly encourage people to check that out. Here's an interesting question for you, John. If how we think impacts how we act, how much impact does how, how we act have on how we think? Yeah, it's a loop. Um, but there's something to really be careful with. Um, there's a big difference between thoughts that we have randomly 35,000 to 50,000 a day and thinking. Thinking does not translate to behavior. And so if you just think about that for a moment. How many times have you thought about what you should do and you still don't? Everybody. And the question is why, and this is really why I've gone deeper than just thinking. I want to know what is the motive for behavior. Motive for action is really known as motivation. And it really is a, a study in what causes the motivational circuit in the brain to light up and the dopamine and the adrenaline to light up that actually is the gas for the car called your body to take action and move into doing what you need to do. See, here's what I want everybody, just, just answer this question yourself. If you want to know how to telephone prospect better, is the information readily available to you if you want it? Yes. If you want to learn how to door knock better, is the information readily available to you? Yes. If you want to build your business based on referrals, can you get the information on how to? Yes. If you want to advertise and market, is the information available to you? Yes. Every single how to, your industry already knows the answers. So the only real shift, if you want to succeed more than you have, is getting yourself to do the things that we already know you should do and can do, but you're not. And you either have a belief that's holding you back, you have perceptions of reality that may be distorted, where you think that you know somebody else can do this, but you can't because, and fill in the blank, you have a story, and your identity is tied to that story. And that story has plot lines, and that is what drives what you do or don't do more than your thinking. 
So if you don't get into the part of your brain, the part you own, you own all of this, and make a few tweaks there, you will be outstanding at gathering more information. Come to another webinar, come to another virtual training, read another book, go to another one of Tom Ferry's or Mike Ferry's or, or Joe Stump's or, um, or um, uh, Howard Brinton, and these are all names I've known from the past. Go to another event and still not. More, ma more maps coaching for those KW people. More oh, maps coaching, yeah. You know, so I'm gonna, that just shows you how long it's been, it's been in, in the market, or Brian Buffini's or whoever they are. You can get all the training you want, but unless you train your brain to overcome the stuff that is preventing you from taking action right now, I can promise you there's a handful of people on this call that will hit their potential in the next 12 to 24 months. You'll have the dreams, the goals, and the desires to, but unless you really understand what creates breakthrough thinking, and breakthrough behaviors um, that you can sustain, um, you may go and do well because you're motivated after this call for a day or two or a week, but I can tell you that there's a thermostat in your brain. It's a thermostat-like mechanism that as soon as you get out of your effective comfort zone, up or down from your comfort zone, you will pretty much end up at the end of this year where you did at the end of last year plus maybe 10 or 15 or 20 percent. But if you want to double or triple your income, change the operating system that drives the thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. Mm, I love it. So one, one person asked where they can find the Brainathon, and if you look at the link that is on the screen, the one thing.com slash upgrade my mindset, that will take you to their page for the Brainathon. And, and John, you said something that, that was really interesting. I'm, I'm watching um, Rob's question in the group, and this is something that I think a lot of people have limiting beliefs around where there's a digital course that they want to invest in or there's a coaching program that they want to invest in. For him, it's, it's mastery coaching. And he's saying, I, I'm having the fear of signing up for mastery coaching. My coaches and, and all my people are saying that it's the next logical step. What's stopping me? Talk, talk to us about what happens in that moment. Okay, so here's what happens. You, uh, you hear from people that, hey, it's great, it's the next level um, for you, and, and there's a part of you that believes that because you trust them and believe them. But when you've bought other courses before, when you've bought other books before, when you've signed up for other things before, and you didn't take action, then you have a fear of what? A fear of not taking action again and then ending up losing money, wasting money or time. You have a fear of disappointing yourself or your spouse or significant other or your manager or your partner or your friend that you told that you're doing this. So we are protecting at all times our identity. We are protecting at all times anything that has got real or potential danger associated with it, or real or potential pain associated with it, disappointment, when we are disappointed in ourselves, how do we feel? We feel embarrassed or ashamed. Well, why the hell would I even consider putting myself into one more thing that I'm ashamed of? Shame is when we blame ourselves. Shame is blame turned inwards. So when we even, at a non-conscious level, think that that possibility exists, we will not step over that line because the safety of what we know is more comfortable than the fear of what we don't. And we will do more to avoid the pain. And so the pain could be real or imagined. And this is why people, I mean, this is why your buyers get buyer's remorse. Yeah, I love the house, love the house, love the house. Well, what if it's too expensive? What if it's the wrong house? What if this, what if that? It's called the terror barrier. And so these are all things that you can learn how to feel the fear and turn it into your fuel. One of the sessions you know, that, that I teach um, uh, is turning fear into fuel. Fear is nothing more than an electrochemical response in the body. With an untrained person, it causes them to, to freeze or 
to fight it. In a trained person, it causes them to turn the fuel into adrenaline and norepinephrine to take action and to go for it. The untrained person feels the fear, the stress, and they put on the brakes. The trained person feels the fear and they put on the gas. So this is a perfect segue. Uh, I see how much amazing information is out there. And I, the, the people who are on this, whether they realize it or not, just invested their most valuable resource, which is their time. Yet most people, in my experience, don't guarantee themselves a return on that investment by taking action. I've been watching the chat box. I've been watching all of you and seeing the positive feedback on this, and I know that your mind's being expanded. Yet if, I'm curious how many of you, if you're honest with yourself, are questioning how you can actually take action on this information, how you can actually implement it. If so, put yes in the chat box. And so my question for you, John, is through the message of the one thing, what is the one thing that they can do to implement this material such that by doing it will make everything else easier or unnecessary? Okay, so the one thing that you can do, simple and easy, it's called cognitive priming. Cognitive priming just means that you are going to prime your brain. So here's what I want everyone to do. I know you all have goals, and I sure hope you have goals, and I hope you have them written down. I want you every day for five minutes, not for five hours, for five minutes. I want you to take out your goals, whether it's on a sheet of paper, whether it's laminated, whether it's on a vision board that you might have, or whether it's on your computer or your iPad or iPhone. It doesn't matter. Take your goals. And I want you to prime your brain in this way. Number one, say to yourself, I am so grateful and happy that I am doing everything to achieve my goals and dreams. I am so grateful and happy that I am doing everything I can to achieve my goals and dreams. So I want you just to look at your goals and get emotionally attached to them and repeat that I am so grateful and happy that I'm doing everything I can to achieve my goals and dreams. So that's step one. Step two, after you do that three, four, five times, close your eyes and see if you can overcome any obstacles that are in your way right now from that being a reality. What do I mean by that? Well, if you don't believe that it's possible, see yourself overcoming that belief. If you don't have the skills, see yourself overcoming that by learning the skills. If you don't have the strategies, see yourself learning what you need to do and actually getting to those goals. So that's step two. See yourself overcoming whatever obstacles you currently have, real ones or imagined, it doesn't matter. The act of doing this actually strengthens your brain to show you that you can overcome the obstacles. And then the third part, and this is all done within five minutes, is see yourself actually celebrating the achievement of your goal. So one is the affirmation. Two, see the obstacles, hear them, feel them, and see yourself overcoming them. And three, celebrate the achievement of that. Now, do not start this if you're only going to do it for the next seven days. If you really want to be serious, make a commitment in your calendar that you're going to do this right after you go to the bathroom and do your thing in the morning and before you eat breakfast so that you can give this some conscious, focused attention. Prime your brain with those three things every day, and I promise you, your focus for the day, for the week, for the month, for the quarter, for the half year and year will shift. And that's the beginning of getting your brain to use its genius. I love it. I love it. And for the people who are familiar with the book, make that your 66-day challenge. Um, so that is John Astorap, ladies and gentlemen. And I think by now you know why we brought him on. If you want to check out his brain, it's on. Go to the onething.com slash upgrade my mindset. And then I know um, we got started late today because of audio issues. What we are going to do, I am starting to do live streams every single week in our new Facebook group, which you can see the link at the bottom, facebook.com slash the one thing book. I'm going to do one this Thursday at 1 o'clock central time, and that's a way for us to do some additional Q&A, so block that out on your calendar. 
uh, go to that link, like the page, and then you'll be notified about this. Uh, John, thanks so much, man. You brought tremendous value. It was great to talk with you again. Anything we can do to support you right now? I'm really good. I, I love the real estate industry. It uh, provided me my start when I was 19 years old and I was lost and didn't feel like I was smart enough or good enough or worthy enough or that I ever amount to much. And it offered me um, you know, an opportunity to develop myself personally. And so now I love to give back to the industry that uh, helped grow me. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it, brother. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for being with us today. Hopefully, I will see you on Thursday for our live stream.